I met Loba some uh, time ago at Venture Cafe, and he fascinated me with what he does. He's an amazing uh, speaker, and uh, his uh, his work, both with his companies and as an author, is really cool. And it's uh, it's great that he's here today. He's gonna share a bit about his journey, and then I believe it's gonna be a Q and A in which you can uh, yeah. sort of. Uh, Loba, you just go ahead. Okay, so, um, well, my name is Loba. Nice to meet you. Uh, I don't really know where you guys are at, so my first question kind of before I shape everything about me is I want to know where are you guys, like are you like literally from Syria and you walked here or like what's happening? Well, Somebody want to volunteer? We have a lot of different stories. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like most of us are from Syria. Yeah. We have uh, someone who's from Eritrea. And uh, like a big majority came here like through the illegal way somehow. Except me, I came like legally. Yeah. But yeah, the most of us have like different stories of course. Yeah. But the same for So you're starting literally from zero yes. and it's kind of, but do you have families with you or completely alone uh, or some of us alone? have their families, some of us alone. Okay. Most of us alone. Yeah, most of us are alone. Okay, how many of you know the language, Dutch? <coughs> Beijing. Beijing. <laughs> how many of you are learning the language? All of us. All of us. Oh, okay. That, that's a good thing. Okay, are you so Dutch, by the way? I am Belgian, but Belgian, Belgian Dutch. Oh. They speak also Dutch. Flemish. Cool. Um, okay, so my story is, uh, my story actually relevant to you starts now seven years ago. Um, I was at the time a student, um, and and at the moment I so I had parents, family, everything, and something happened with my family that they seemed to kind of break away from each other, and I didn't fit into that story, so I was kind of dumped and left alone. And the only thing that kind of kept me through at that moment, I know it's not the same thing. But the way I'm getting to the way the, the way I am right now is very relevant to you guys. So I thought to talk about that. So when they broke away, I was left kind of alone, um, not, not having any skills. I was very young, not knowing any people. I didn't have friends, and I didn't have any family. The only thing that kind of kept me going was one vision. And it was that when I was six years old, I always wanted to graduate law. And uh, hi. And, uh, and so I was very stubborn somehow, and I didn't have any money. Like, I had 200 euros on my bank account, but a month later, my dad kind of called the bank and gave some shitty story, and they kind of blocked my bank account. So I didn't even have a bank account at one point. So I, I was kind of stuck there uh, with nothing, just this one crazy vision, and, and a very stubbornly way of, the, the world kind of owes me because I didn't deserve this. And, and so I was going through all these government instances and I was going through all these student grants applications and I would walk into the offices and I'd be like, look at the horrible thing that happened to me. Give me like money because I want to study. Like eventually you will win because I will pay more taxes as a lawyer than uh, if, if you wouldn't support me. And as you might have guessed, nobody supported me. <laughs> and then at one point, I came to uh, an old lady, and she was um, head of, it, it was a, a pseudo government instance, but not really. They supported minors that were put in my situation. And again, with the same attitude, I approached him and I said, Look, give me money, like, you'll get everything like 10 times more back. And it was, like a long process but eventually like we sat down they invited me I, I kind of like I didn't know they would accept me and I, I went to the office and we sat down with the head of the of the instance and the government and uh, and I kind of sat down with them and I was like oh so you guys are supporting me now <laughs> super arrogant and the woman says yes we are supporting you but have you ever thought that if you would have approached us nicely it would have gone faster. So I attribute that sentence, and I still have it in my mind, I attribute that sentence to pretty much the way I act as of then. Uh, so I don't, I don't see that the world owes me now, but I approach everything from the positive perspective, 
and it does get me way faster results. So most of you I'm assuming are positive, but I just wanted to shape that story to kind of shape how the rest of my life went. So here I am now, finally I'm getting some kind of money. Um, I can continue my journey on studying law, which I did. But here comes the next problem. I don't have any relationships in my life. I'm literally alone in a room. At least I have shelter and I have food, right? So the first main thing is cover for myself. So what started off then is kind of the journey of finding friends. I realized at one point that so I had two friends, literally two friends. I had my, my best buddy that I grew up with since I was three or four years old. Um, and he had a, a friend that was a girl. So obviously I would stalk this girl and ask her like, how do you get like a girlfriend? Like how do you get, and all these kind of silly, silly stuff. Um, and what happened is that I realized that people don't know how to have relationships or how to build new relationships. And so she would answer, just be yourself, just do this, and that's, fucking, that's horrible advice. So, um, but what did happen is because I thought I needed to become social, I needed to get friends, stuff started popping up. It's called the, the Bader-Meinhof effect, which is if you start looking for stuff, stuff will start popping up. For instance, if you buy a Ferrari, you start seeing Ferraris everywhere. That's the Bader-Meinhof effect. So stuff started popping up, stuff like books started popping up, mentors on YouTube started popping up, and I started following all of this. I'm gonna skip a couple of years, but eventually what happened is, um, like I would do silly stuff like go in the streets, go in the bars, go in the libraries, and all this stuff, and I approached so many people to get to the point where I was like, okay, I have some people in my life that I can trust, and let's test my skills now, because I was still arrogant. Um, and I went into a sales job to really test my skills. And I went into the sales job and I was approaching door to door. And what happened is, and this is the next part, which is very, very important. I had acquired skills and now I needed the quantity to prove that the skills are actually legit. So what followed is in the next couple of months, I broke a couple of sales records for that company. Now, why am I telling you this? Is this good or bad? It's a validation that your skills are legit. If I had not broken those sales records, I would have gone back to where I started, which is asking people, oh, how do I do this? Reading the right books, going on YouTube, and so on. Obviously, as I was going through the sales course, I was still improving, but I was listening more critically to certain people. So this kind of shapes that in the beginning, you should kind of, you listen a lot, and then as your skills get validated, you start becoming critical. So we skip, now I'm working, I'm doing law, I'm working seven to eight jobs because I was a student, so it was really shitty jobs. And now I'm stuck, I have so much stuff to do, it's just crazy, I'm stressed out of my mind, I'm burning out every three months, which I thought was normal. And I end up kind of stuck. And I had one mentor, and the mentor told me, you need to figure out a way, it, it was the most stupid advice, but so simple. You need to figure out a way to get all those seven to eight jobs into one and earn more money. That's literally what he said. And I'm like, okay, so how do I do that? And he's like, figure it out. <laughs> and again, Bader Meinhof thing gets triggered. And I'm like, okay, I need to figure out a way. So somehow I'm scrolling through the internet as you usually do. And I see this Australian guy pop up, um, my, my mentor now, Timothy Mark, and he teaches guys how to have a business. Somebody read, has somebody read Tim Ferriss' four hour work week book? So, Theodore has, but it, in the book he explains the way the business is set up, which is a business that is completely automated so that you can do the stuff that you like to do, like me speaking here right now. So he teaches that thing, my mentor Timothy Mark and I started following his advice and what kind of ensued is I started setting up a business which is the business that I have right now still uh, that combined all of those jobs into one and because I started automating all of that I had the, 
the freedom to kind of graduate in peace and not burn out every couple of seconds. And so skip again a couple of years and we're coming to the relevant part, which is I'm speaking now at all these conferences. I'm sharing my experiences. I was working for a student organization called ISEC at the time, which is one of the largest student organizations. So they organize like 500 conferences a year. And I apply for one conference a month and I go and I speak there. And one conference I get there, which is a year and a half ago. I get there and just like here, I sit down with a small group. Um, I had my own group, but this was like this one external workshop where the speaker didn't show up, they didn't have anybody. So they asked me and another uh, co-speaker co to, to deliver a workshop called Work-Life Balance. And I literally asked my agenda manager, okay, Work-Life Balance, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> and he says, I don't know, just do it. There was no goal, there was nothing. There was literally just a title, Work-Life Balance. So I'm like, okay, so what do we talk about? Work-Life Balance is super fluffy, not practical. Everything we've heard so far is just not applicable right away. I'm doing a business, I'm studying law, I'm super practical, I can't do all of that. And we sat down with my co-speaker and I realized that in the last eight years, everything that my mentors had given me, the the little one-liners, the little approaches to life, uh, made it so that I could have a work-life balance and I could avoid those burnouts that I used to have all the time. And I took three principles. We had a 90-minute workshop, so three principles, 30 minutes each. And I delivered that workshop. And I delivered, at that point, maybe 15 plus conferences. And I realized that in that one workshop, I realized that people are really struggling with this stuff. And in that workshop, I gave them the space to open up about it and, and they could ask me anything. And this is kind of where I'm bringing this part, which is right now I have two companies. One is a video marketing agency where we help multinationals. It's partially why I have these cameras that can film everything. And the second company is called Why Not 3. And it's the reason I'm standing here. In Why Not 3, we help people kind of get to a point where they have freedom, and this is freedom of time, money, everything, so that they can follow their passions and become the best they can be. Because I had the privilege to do that, and I noticed that when the people around me have the same privilege, they become really happy. And the way we divide life in Why Not 3 is into health, wealth, and relationships. And as you notice throughout my story, I was figuring out health, wealth, and relationships. And these little things that my mentors had fed me had given me the tools to cope in all three areas. And it's because I had these tools that I'm now standing here after having moved to a new country. I know it's not completely like you guys moved to a new country, but it's still, I moved to a new country. I had to restart from zero. And within two months, we were already catering to some of the biggest multinationals again. So that's kind of my story where I'm at. I'm doing full-time, obviously, my main company, and in the evenings, I'm working on Why Not 3, where, I, where me and my team, we're with four people, we try to help people that we think can help others, um, and we try to give them the tools to realize that, yes, you can do it, and it's all about having the right tools in health, wealth, and relationships. In health, I have a biohacking background, so I, I have all the data that I was tracking throughout all the stress and burnouts. In wealth, I have all my mentors, all the companies that I've set up and automated, um, and even built the communities around Why Not 3. And there's a lot of free content there as well, so you can just go there. And relationships, I have all the mentors that I've gone through there, and also all the data that I collected as I was approaching people, and I wrote down everything. So does that make me the best? For sure not, but it does give me a head start to help someone more step-by-step -step way if they're starting from zero. So with that, I kind of want to ask you, and this is completely open, if this was like the perfect workshop, you don't really know my experience yet, but imagine this is the perfect workshop. What would you want to have help with? Is it restarting a new life? Approaching like a specific company that you want to work with? Ask me, yeah. <coughs> you said that you moved to a new country. Yeah. yeah it's okay. 
and you say that it's kind of like you're moving to a new country, it's okay. But the difference between us and you yeah. is one thing. That you mentioned that, that you have your mentor many times. Yeah. That's the difference between us. Most of us, or maybe all of us, we don't have mentors. True. Nobody, uh, nobody has maybe friends or mentors. We are lost, so we don't have somebody okay. bigger or smaller than us or older or whatever. So, just to tell us what to do, where to start. Do you have, have a mentor? Sorry. Do you have a mentor in your life? Like, make e everything easy. Not, not to say everything easy, but uh, it's really helpful for you. It's like to have a guideline. Yes. Uh, so you want a mentor? Biggest, yes. The biggest helpful thing in, in anybody's life is to have a mentor. Whatever it is. If you, you are studying, if you are working, if yeah. you are whatever you are doing, if you have a mentor, you are in the right way. Yeah. If you are not, you are lost until you True. be your own mentor. So True. that's... And for myself, I'm looking for a mentor. So okay. I'm not uh, identifying him yet. So this resonates with everybody. So you want to find a mentor yes. that kind of guides you through going into a new country? Yes, and that's true. A mentor or a way. The last four years of our life, like I'm speaking on my about yeah. my life, it's kind of... It's kind of, I didn't make any choices. The lo the, my situation made the choice. Yeah, the situation yeah. so so just drive really, us to something I'm not new. the master of my own life. I'm just like, when I see something, I go for it. Well, for we that, like, like, we're totally going with the flow okay. without yeah. knowing what we're doing. So, so after if you would shape it in a question, how would you shape how, it? How to oh. get or to find your mentor? The mentor we have already, yeah. but this is something different. Uh, how to find your way. It's like... Yeah. Your way in life or how your to purpose. Become, how to become the master of your circumstance. Yeah, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, time, so more. If you're struggling with something, uh, share it. I'm pretty sure a lot of people can be helped. Yeah. If you in the middle of your way, if you're stuck in one point, you feel like everything is falling apart. Yeah. And you have you reach a point to, to give up. How to remotivate yourself that to to continue, not stop. Not so not shape it in a sentence so you're stuck and how to remotivate yourself? Yeah. So that, like that kind of Yeah, remotivate yourself or how to believe in yourself again. It just sometimes you, you lost you lose yourself and you don't know what you are anymore. Okay. <laughs> Intense. <laughs> okay, more? This is good. There's some five people. You don't have to share, but I think it can help. People who like to code, they are most of the time really quiet. So yeah, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm like super, <laughs> I'm super like, it took me also like a long time before I could like speak in front of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. To, how to make uh, yeah friendship with the new with someone with a new culture? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. How to talk to someone with a new culture? I must really check this too. To tell them the, the new friend, or what should not? Yeah. Yeah, because we are the first me. I said something. I should not to tell you immediately. I'm something maybe later. What to Okay. That that is my point. Uh, remember that. So like, I'll probably cool. Let's. But it's see. enough. It's a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we'll ask more. Okay. okay. So first of all, let's let's cover mentor. It's the easiest one. Mm -hmm. So. When I shaped my story, I kind of showed you, I kind of showed you already how I discovered mentors, even though it was briefly. I was a complete blank slate, and I was open to everybody. Um, to the point where, well, you have to recognize in what situation you are. So you can't put yourself up arrogantly. Uh, that's when that woman told me, like, if you would have approached it positively, it would have gone faster. The same goes with mentorship. So I have two theories on mentorship, which is one you can go get it for free and one you can pay for it. 
I always advocate paying for it, but I, I know you guys are in a position where you can. But, and this is the main thing, most of us look at mentors as in, we want to play basketball, we go for Michael Jordan. Don't. <laughs> it's not cool. What's the problem with Michael Jordan if you would want to play basketball? Somebody. Sorry? What's the problem with having Michael Jordan as a mentor if you would play basketball and you would start right now? He's a professional. Um, Too tall. Also. It's hard to like, Everybody it's almost like to be impossible to be like, to be like him at first. So yeah, it's so professional. That you're feeling yeah. And okay. what's the most practical thing that's a problem with Michael Jordan? Because we don't have the skills like him. Well, he's a busy man. <laughs> he lives in the States, and he's a busy man, so he'd probably not be able to give you that much time uh, unless you pay him. And, and so he's like, there. And he's a professional. We're like starting out. You think like we're going to, like in his prime, if he would take all these supplements and have these specific diets and all these workout routines, you think like I would start tomorrow with his workout routines and supplements and I'd be like playing ball like he is? No. So that's the problem with mentorship, the way people see it. You don't go for Michael Jordan. You go for the person right in front of you. And it can be a person here, or it can be a person out there. But the one thing that, that has to happen is this person needs to be around you, and he has to spend time on you. And it, it can be even time that he doesn't realize he's spending. So for instance, you go to networking nights here in Rotterdam. So how do I get mentors in this environment? I go to these networking nights every Thursday, and I'm approaching people. I'm like, hey, so what do you think of like building a company in Rotterdam? I've asked this question to a lot of people. I'm not sure if I asked you, probably yes, but I'm asking everybody. And then let's, let's just look at the analytics, right? So in marketing, you have this rule. Out of every 100 people, two to four percent will convert. So I always have that in the back of my mind. So I'm approaching a hundred people and I'm asking them, so how do you build a company in Rotterdam? And then out of those, a lot of people will answer me, but two to four percent will be actually meeting with me, wanting to know more, uh, chatting with me, have a drink. And when I first started out, um, TEDx Rotterdam invited me to the same event where Theodore also spoke at TEDx. And I started talking with the founders. And I was like, so how do you build a company here? And I started chatting with them, and they were so excited. They were happy like, with what we were doing. And so they invited me to another event. And I was like, OK, I'll go there. Um, and this comes like the second part if you're wanting mentorship for free. If you don't have money, you need to exchange something else that is of value. And the one thing, the one commodity that any person wants is time. So you have the luxury of time, which you can offer to this potential mentor. So out of the 100 people that you've approached, two or four will pop up that will be very interesting to you, that can give you the time. What are you giving in return? So here, this is where you can give your time help them with an issue, which then they want to meet you again, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I brought my cameras, and I filmed the TEDx event, and they had an after movie. Uh, but it can be as simple as, so in the early stages, when I didn't have anything, I would approach people, and I'd be like, that girl that I approached, how do you get a girlfriend? How do you do that? And then when we were going out, for instance, I would offer her a drink. Uh, so she didn't have to pay for the drink. And then in return, I was asking like, her a lot of questions. Um, and the main thing, and this comes like the second part and the reason why people would actually mentor you, because 99% of people don't do this, is you take their advice, you apply it, and you share it back to them. If you do this, people will actually mentor you. Because 99% of people will get you a drink, and then they'll be like, hey, that's cool advice, so how do you do this, this, and this? And then it's like an hour that you drain away from them to the point where they're like, oh my god, like maybe you should pay for this because I'm coaching you. Instead of just asking, hey, I'm struggling with this problem, how to meet a girl. Like, No, so I wouldn't go vague. I would go super specific. I went outside and I asked the girl this, or I went outside and I asked this old man, because I'm approaching old men now to get business. <laughs> I asked them this. So I don't know why, but they're responding like this. 
And then my mentor would answer me, so how about you change this to this? Because they usually go on there. And then you go and you approach the same, like, same style of person and you adjust. And now you're not draining your mentor, you're kind of helping, using their advice properly. You're not draining them, they're giving you just one-liners. You go, you apply, and then you share your experience. And you always share like, hey, I've done this and the results are amazing. So every time I have my mentors, and still I do this, I, for instance, I'm struggling with Facebook ads, right? I go to my mentor, and I'm like, this Facebook ad's not converting. And then he's like, try this, this, and this. So I go, I try, and then I report the results. Oh, I got three more conversions, but I'm still struggling with this, this, and this. So you see, so you're feeding dopamine to them, like good feelings and everything. So how to get a mentor? Think realistically, don't think Michael Jordan. Get close, like get close to a person in the vicinity, and then ask them practical advice, go out, apply it, and share it again. And it can be as practical, and this is how I get big clients as well. I stand at the same thing over and over. So I would, every Thursday, no matter what, I'm at Venture Cafe, which means the same people know me, the same people uh, talk to me. Uh, and every time I've talked to them, and they've actually shared advice with me, I go and apply it to the week. And then in Thursday, I come back, and I'm like, yeah, I applied your advice, it was really cool. Or some people started a new app, right? Like there's a guy that started a new app which like offers free coffee. So like that week I share it with my girlfriend, she goes and tries it, and then the next week I'm like, hey yeah, this is really cool, like my girlfriend tried it. So how do they feel? They, they feel like this guy actually goes, executes, applies, maybe I should share more with him. And then it's all about being the long game. So you invest, you invest, you invest. And then at one point, this is mentorship, you will hit a level where you kind of outgrown them. And so that's when their limitations become your limitations. So you kind of have to go to the next mentor. So there's never like one mentor. I have a mentor in health, I have one in wealth, in relationships, it's completely different. Um, but what helps me, for instance, is having that definition of health, wealth, and relationships. And it doesn't come from nowhere. So. There's a, a guy called Kenton Knepper that defined life into health, wealth, and relationships because he said that any and every problem you have in life, you can put into all these areas. Any problem you have in those three areas, if you take that model and you apply it to your personal development, because that's mentorship, then you have to realize that, okay, I'm struggling with, probably it's building a new life, so wealth, you need to get financially stable. So the first focus will be, I need a mentor. It's not Michael Jordan, but right here uh, in wealth, where do I find them? And now you, and this is what we teach in Why Not Free, you have this silent day. Every Sunday is like a silent day where you completely map out your life. So you map out your wealth and you're like, we're in Rotterdam, where do I find this mentor? Venture Cafe every Thursday, um, TEDx, organizes events every couple of months. Uh, then you have like these networking nights. Go on Eventbrite, that's, that's what I'm doing. You go on Eventbrite and you literally look at all these events. And then just be a little bit nice to people and, be, and just share your story. Hey, I'm struggling with, how are you doing it? And then just share back and keep in contact. And that's like how you start. And, and the one thing that we always say and for instance, with me, right? So you, when you go to whynot3.com, there's a 30-day challenge. Everything's free. And most of the people now on YouTube, everything's free. So you can go, and if a person in Venture Cafe doesn't give you the right advice, you go on the internet, you read a book, you go on a 30-day challenge, watch videos, like stuff like that, and, and you combine everything. So, which kind of brings me to, like the mentorship, is it answered? Or like? No, it's okay, yes, yeah. It comes, tend to, yeah. Yeah, uh, th it brings me to what I shared in the 30 day challenge, which is the power of consistency. You have to play long, long game. Um, Theodore, it took like two, three months before we finally hopped on the call. <laughs> so <laughs> you play the long game and you build up. You build like relationships up. You don't go for, hey, Theodore, can I speak at Restart now? <laughs> it's like three months later, hey, do you want me to pass by? <laughs> so, so, yeah, just be 
just know that it takes patience and consistency. So always show your face, always be positive. Um, and if you're positive, it'll go faster than you think. If you push it, it won't. It can happen, but it still it'll take longer. So that's my take on mentorship. At one point, you'll get to a point where if you trigger the power of consistency, you'll have mentors that will teach you how to get millions. And it'll take a couple of years, but if you do it every time, you'll get there faster than you think. So it, it compounds. So, and then at, what, at that point, which you're not there right now, but I will advise you at that point, also like pay people, pay people to be around them. Uh, that's your biggest growth hack, <coughs> shortcuts to, to mentorship. The best mentors that I've got, I've paid to be around them. Mm -hmm. uh, like I took one mentor, I literally, I didn't have anything. I had like, I had like 900 euros in my bank account. I was still a student. I just like signed up to that sales job. And I knew that mentor was in New York. So I put the deposit down of like 450 euro, and that was the moment where I smashed all the sales records. And then like two months later, I put the next deposit down, and I traveled to New York, and it was all fine. So like there were moments in my life where I did that, and it put me in the, in the position where I was next to these people. And you're only as good as the five people around you, which is super cliche, but it's true. But you can start with venture. Mm -hmm. So does that answer mentorship? You can go like books and stuff like that. Um, how to find your way, which was you, right? Um, so at one point I was going through my life, exactly the same thing uh, where I didn't know what was happening with me. Like I didn't deserve for sure that people dropped me and and that I was like stuck in this small room and didn't have, I literally didn't have anything. And everything that kind of popped up was just like, it's better, so I'll just jump on it. So the one thing that saved me in that moment was to have a vision. I had a clear vision that no matter what happened, I needed to have a law degree, which means that every decision that I took was shaped around getting that law degree. Even the businesses that I have today are just the complete like uh, explanation of that. They're as much automated as I can automate them right now. Because when I started them, like when I started my main business, I needed to automate them. So when you're going through, especially when you're going through something like you guys are going right now, you need to have some kind of vision. It can be practical as getting a law degree, or it can be as practical as, I want to earn this much money, uh, live in this environment with these kind of people, um, and we call it crafting the perfect day. So when, this is part of what my mentor told me, which is you go, you take on the silent day, you take like a piece of paper, actually you take an entire notebook, and you, you write down as many pages as you can of your perfect day. You wake up, what do you do? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? Um, and you just craft this perfect day. And I, I would craft this perfect day every six months. And so as you're going through your perfect day exercise, you will gain a clarity of what it is that you actually want. And so throughout your six months or one year or whatever, Decisions will pop up and it'll be like get a job there But then you'll know that it won't bring you closer to your perfect day or get a job there And you, you know it'll get you closer. So an example would be for instance For instance my girlfriend, right? So she knows that she wants to have like a little bit more freedom So even though she gets job requests for really cool stuff She knows it'll take too much time. And she doesn't want that. She wants and she, she has it really clearly. She wants 30 hours in a job and then her side hustle next to it. So it doesn't matter how big the job is. The moment it's like 40, 50 hours, like she starts thinking, oh, this is really cool, but. And so suddenly she's not stuck in the flow of life. She's kind of like sucked out of it. She looks at it really objectively and is like, this is a really painful job it's not aligned to my goals that I want, 
So I guess I can't take it. And what happens now? She doesn't have, like she does have something, but she also has in her mind, okay, I can't get this, which means that now I have to go do lead generation, if you call it that way, which is I have to go call other people in this industry because that's the industry where I wanna be and get a job there. And she's postponing it right now because she's still working, but the moment like her job is about to finish up, she'll do that. And so, and she's getting all these job offers now to work in the parliament and everything. And so that's kind of how she gains perspective. Uh, so that's from the job perspective. From the business perspective, same kind of thing. You need to have a kind of mission and goal. And we call it a why not three, you need to have your why, like your code and your why. Uh, Simon Sinek talks about it in Start With Why, a really good book. Uh, we've crafted like the exercise, which I share in the 30 day challenge as well, which is an exercise that you can really just put your why in a sentence. And my why, which I said and shared in the beginning, was to inspire freedom in others so they can follow their passions and become the best they can be. Which means any and every decision that will pop up uh, that is aligned to my why, I will take. Restart network, it was like, it was like a test for me. Is Restart Network a thing where I would talk at? And I just look at my why, I'm like, yeah, I will, so I'll make time for it. Um, and then if some other big company pops up, but there are people that totally don't trust, then I probably won't do it. Um, and what happens is, over the short term, you grow slower, but over the long term, you skyrocket. Uh, and that's how you start gaining control over your life. So having my vision in the beginning gave me the stability to take the right decisions uh, instead of ending up working in a factory somewhere where I can assume most of the people in my situation would have ended up. Um, and also the belief in yourself. And this is the second thing why people don't follow that uh, thing that I told you, the why, the, the vision, everything, which is you might know that it's bad for you, but you still do it because you don't trust yourself too much. And that's kind of where it's a hit or, hit or like, lose scenario. You have to blindfully trust yourself that you can do it with the risk of, and that's what, what kept me going, is I have gone through really bad shit, so even if I end up under a bridge, this is gonna work for me. And having that blind faith in you and your skills um, will help. And how can you actually gain that confidence, which I shared also in my story, you go into specific jobs that validate your skills so that at that point you're like, wait a second, I actually can do it. And now this blind faith that you have is not so blind anymore. So there are like two parts. So you really need to trust yourself and you need to follow your advice. So does that answer it? Kind of? Yeah, somehow, yeah. I remember saying while you were talking, I remember saying about myself what I really want to do. It's and very vague, but... No, somehow, yeah, I, I knew it, but somehow I took forgiveness. Your gut feeling, like your gut feeling over the long term will mm -hmm. play out well. The only thing is that you need to trust and validate that it will. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're constantly saying, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, and you're really shit at it, like don't do it. Mm -hmm. But if you truly believe that this is what you are made of because you've tried everything else and it just doesn't feel right, and this feels right and you can actually sustain yourself, over the long term it will pay off. So the, to the people that have experienced what you guys have experienced, it will probably sound logical. To the people that haven't experienced what you have, have experienced, it'll sound vague. So, I don't know, maybe I should explain it more, or yeah, is it clear? Yeah, or? Like you said, if you, wanna have, if you have an idea about what you really want to do, you yeah. have to really go in that direction, because sometimes we get lost. Okay, I got this opportunity, okay, I need to find a job, I will go for it. No, I should wait and the, see. The only if difference, really the only difference is it needs to be written down. Yeah. I think it was Jim Rohn um, that said, a goal not written down is not a goal at all. So every silent day, like everything is mapped out, everything is written down. Like I have my wallet, right? So this is like the best example. 
in my wallet, I have like this thing that I crafted on Photoshop, and it says on my checking account it'll have one hundred and four thousand euros. And then my say, and like I watch this every day, and and at one point, you know, when I first started out, it was like I'll have a Visa card. <laughs> so you know, it like it starts from nothing. Uh, so you can really do, it, you can craft it, but it needs to be written down. So, yeah, that's, so that's how you take control of your life, um, and you make the decisions. And the beauty of that is once you start making your own decisions, you accept the, the hardships that come along. While if you don't take your decisions and just go with, with the flow of life, you get really frustrated, and that, that's when you end up screaming at your boss, like, oh, screw you, man, I didn't choose for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, does that answer? Does that answer? Yeah. Good. Thanks. So how, when you get stuck, do you motivate yourself? Who, who asked this? Uh, so, so, again, uh, what did you mean with that? Even though when you find your way, you choose your way. You are working, you start with your own company, yeah. your own business. But you reach to the point that you are done. You have to give up. Yeah. Or the things is not for you. But in deep inside, you, you know that this is for you. What are the things you need to re-motivate yourself that, to keep doing it? Okay. Um, well, first of all... Uh, Please, say it personally. What do you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, first of all, and that's what I said just now, which is you have to validate whether you're good at it. Mm -hmm. So if at any point I would become an entrepreneur and like I would fail and lose a ton of money, I'd be like, maybe I'm not an entrepreneur. So, so the humility to not be arrogant, like in the beginning of my story, like that woman told me, if you would have been a bit more positive about it, uh, you would have get it, gotten it faster. The same thing applies to this. If you're stuck and you're like failing and it's not working, like maybe take a step back and don't be so, I'm not saying about you, I'm talking about my experience, don't be so arrogant about it. Actually look at it and is it something you should be doing? Which is something, for instance, law, right? I wanted to become a lawyer since I was six years old. And then at one point, especially when my company started growing, and I, I, I ended up be procrastinating so much on this law stuff, and in my free time I would do my companies. So that would be like my procrastination. And then I stepped back and I was like, is this really what I should be doing? And my, the thing that made it for me is my best friend actually ended up in a really big law firm, and I saw his day to day. And, and that's where my why came in, my why, to, to have freedom, follow my passions and become the best I can be. And here I'm stepping back and I'm looking at my life. Am I gonna become a corporate lawyer? I loved corporate law, like I love everything about corporate law, but I couldn't imagine myself in that life. It was completely against my why, it completely against everything that I stood for. While I had these companies that were completely automated and I was working with all these people that I wanted to work with. We were literally working with these multinationals that if I would become a lawyer, it would take me 10 years to get there. So I stepped back and I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't become a lawyer. And it wasn't easy, it really wasn't. And I had other decisions like that. Um, for instance, uh, there was a company, not a company, an organization that I founded, the National Trainers Team um, in, in ISEC. And for me, the national trainer team that I founded was, it was like my baby. It was like, that's the thing that I thought it would change the entire country and organization that we had. And I put a, an executive in place because I didn't have the time to run it. And a month later, I figured out that this was the worst person that could run it. And so I had two choices, whether I go in there and like make this drama and everything and like kick him out and no, I was like, this is not according to what I should do. And I kind of stepped away and I accepted. It's not that easy, right? I had my girlfriend who was like with me and she was like, 
calm down, it's okay, it's okay. And it took a while, but I accepted the choices. I wasn't arrogant about it, and I was very objective. And then knowing yourself, knowing my why, my code, I understood certain decisions that I shouldn't be doing that. Now, something different happens is, if, for instance, you're in a business, you've proven and validated your skills are right, you're supposed to be an entrepreneur, but now the market is stagnated. So that's something different. That's when you have to reinvent yourself. And that's where I share the advice and my mentor shared the advice with me, which is don't be too emotional about what you sell. So if I see the market going somewhere else, I will adapt the product. I won't change what we stand for or what we do, but I will adapt the product to kind of where the need is of the market. So if a client asks us, oh, can you do this? I'm not, so for instance, at one point Coca-Cola approached us and they asked for a commercial. But we don't, we don't really do commercials. We do like high quantity video edits and then we do the whole distribution and marketing. So this commercial popped up and I was like, oh damn. <laughs> but I accepted and we did it. So we figured out a way to do this commercial and that ended up really good and going uh, internally over entire Coca-Cola Europe. So I'm not, I'm not like emotional about what I do. I can adapt to the needs of my clients, which is what every business and employee in my eyes should be doing. The people that get stuck and very emotional as to what they are doing, those are the people that will end up really, really bad. And I have personal examples in my life that frustrate me every day because those people are just stuck. And I'm, I'm, at one point, like, I was screaming at them, like, like, don't, like, you're losing a ton of money. So don't be emotional about what it is that you do. So those are like the two things about it. Uh, reinvent yourself when you're stuck or like look back and see when you should be walking away. Uh, and the way, so where I got that attitude was when I was, remember I was approaching all these people and becoming social and everything. So the one key advice that my mentor gave me at the time is you need to recognize when you need to walk away. And when you walk away, it's always positive. So sometimes you will go into a group of people and you'd be like, hey guys, what's up, blah, blah. And then these people would be like, what are you doing here? Like, get away. And then what are you gonna do? Are you gonna be there like, no, no, let's talk, it's totally fine. No, you're gonna be like, I'm sorry, thank you so much for your time, and you walk away. The same thing goes in, in life. So recognize when you have to walk away, and when you walk away, walk away positive. Don't walk, that's why I don't like these stories of people like, screw you boss, like blah. No, you should have recognized to walk away sooner and you should have walked away with a positive attitude. Because you never know if those people will become really good friends later on or business partners and stuff like that. And I've gotten business like that later on. Those people would become business partners or something like that. So that's about <clears throat> like that. Uh, stuck and remote, so for me, the remotivation part is if you listen to yourself in the market, you won't get to the point where you have to remotivate yourself because you're constantly reinventing yourself. You have to. The market is constantly like, uh, whenever I get bored in my companies, I do something else. So at this point, like I've written a book because I wanted to write a book. And then I wrote that book and I was like, so what do I do now? I was getting bored. So I started writing a second book. So you constantly reinvent yourself. And in 2017, we're gonna release a couple of books, so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> in English or in Dutch, your book? No, English, everything's in English. Why not phrase completely English? Because of people like you, um, mm -hmm. there are more like uh, out there that I think can benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything is in English, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna start catering to the Dutch market as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, keep yourself, it, it's your fault if you're not motivated, um, and so always step back and see why you're not motivated and do something about it. Uh, so friends with, does that answer the question? So friends with a new culture. Well, never like give, give up your authentic self. Um, so I had, I read a book once, uh, and this guy is really graphical, so some people won't like him, some people will like him. Um, the one thing that I would get from this guy is 
his message, which is always be very, very authentic to who you are, because those are the people that uh, help. So when I was like approaching people, there are like a ton of people that will tell you, um, be like, hey, like, where's the Starbucks? And then you start chatting with them. So don't do that. <laughs> Because of the fact that, and that's what this guy, Alan Roger Curry, talks about. He says, you're approaching a person for a specific reason. Um, so be upfront and honest about it so that there's no manipulation. And he calls it mode one. And then you have mode two, which is the not upfront and honest. That's like where you start like, hey, what's up? Like, hey, have you heard about like that TV show the other day? And then out of the blue, you're like, hey, so we're selling this product. And then these people feel cheated because they're like, I thought you wanted to have a chat with me and here you're selling shit to me. <laughs> so be upfront and honest about the entire thing. Um, and if you're upfront and honest from the beginning, then you can like become friends with them and everything. So if your goal is to become friends with them, then think about, I want to become friends with people. And then you're chatting with them and then you're like, Hey, what's up? And you would ask genuinely, and you would listen genuinely. And when, when they get cagey, those are usually the people that are very much mode two. So they're very like, they would manipulate. They would be like, probably selling you something or wanting to get something from you. So this is how I filter those people out. When you are mode one, that's what he says. When you're mode one, upfront and honest, there is no room for manipulation. If you're mode two and you're like going under the radar, you leave room for manipulation and so you get manipulated back. And it's in that manipulation back that people get mad. So the people that initially manipulated get manipulated back and then they're like, oh, what? Like, why did you do this to me? Had they been mode one, upfront and honest, they would not have been manipulated. Now, the reason many people don't like Alan Roger Curry is because he uses very graphical like examples, but the key message like stands there. If you're upfront and honest, and you genuinely want to bond and help people, and you're positive about it, your reactions will genuinely show that. And so you would go to any place, even a Starbucks, and you would approach a person and you'd sit next to them and be like, hey, is this seat free? Can I sit next to you? Can I chat with you? People will accept you with open arms. The people that won't accept you, those are the people that are mode two. They are the people that would usually manipulate. Or, or they're maybe super busy or they had a bad day or something like that. But you'd be surprised. And so, and then again, conversion rates, and that's where my analytical mind goes in. If you approach 100 people, like two or four of them will become really good friends of yours. You never know. And how do you get the quantity in an environment like this? Um, you go like every Thursday, there's a networking night here with people, uh, and you just approach. You're like, hey man, what's up? Like, you want to chat? Like you said at the beginning, you really have to, to close to someone for a reason, for a specific reason. But some, some, some people, they don't want to benefit or something. What you, what, what you mean with this close to this? No, you have to know what your reason is. Like, if you want to have a job, you approach in a different way than if you want a friend. If you want to have a friend, you go to specific like events, like you join a club somewhere, you start chatting with people, um, and you're just upfront. You're like, that I just moved here, so what am I doing? I'm going to these events, and I'm like, uh, like not the networking nights. On the networking nights, I'm like, <coughs> I'm business, because that's my mode one. I want business there, so I'm talking about business. But if I'm like at a, like I do martial arts, right? So I go there, and I'm like, hey, what's up? Like, what's good in Rotterdam? Where can you go out in Rotterdam? And then they start talking. I'm like, hey, do you like want to go there together? And, um, and so is there like much of a culture gap? There's always a culture gap, but if you are mode one, the culture gap won't play that much because there's like there are differences the difference won't play that much have you ever heard the story where um, a guy and a girl meet up and like they have a date on Google Translate because they don't speak the language so I've heard these stories and I've actually seen these stories like people that do that so and, and the reason why is because 
they know why they're there, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which culture, which language, it works. And the same goes with friends, the same goes with business. If people know why you're there, becoming a friend, wanting business, then it won't matter if your culture is different, like as long as like they accept it, you know what I mean? When the same goes here, if you're constantly positive and you're really wanting to have friends, then you approach all these people super positive. Hey, like, hey, do you want to go like for a drink? Some people will say no. Some people will say yes. And those people can become friends. So, and the same goes with Dutchies. And the people that say no, those are usually the people that are mo too, or they have wrong preconceptions. But those are the people that you don't want to be with. We have a, we have a, I feel I have a gap between, because I'm 28 right now, and the person is 28, I make the friend 28, I feel a gap, because I left everything in Syria, and he have everything here. Yeah. So I feel, I, yeah, in, some way, in some way I give him a feeling, I am close to him for benefit, for for reason. He have a full-time job, he have a car, yeah. he have a, many friends, he have everything, and I have little thing. Okay. So this 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 cab gives me a little bit of not comfortable, not uh, cross okay. myself. Okay. So is that his problem? Yeah, it's this a uh, what I feel. I don't. But feel then, is it his problem or is it your problem? Uh, it's your problem, I think. Cause the way you think about yeah. it. Yeah. The way but you think. Do you see that? So, when uh, do you see it or not? No, they no. That's so bad stuff. If if you're going to think that you don't have anything to offer, then at one point that's going to be the case. And then it's not going to work. While if you feel that your friendship is enough to offer, that's what you're going to feel. So you are already being mo too. You're not telling this person how you feel. You leave room for manipulation, which at one point, somehow he'll be taking it because self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you were mode one from the beginning, which is, hey man, like, I really want to be friends with you, and I think that we have like a good connection, you're really cool, I'm learning a lot from you, uh, but I feel like I don't have anything to offer for you. How would he answer? He would also answer mode one. He would answer, hey no man, be whack. <laughs> But do you know what I mean? Yes. If you leave room for manipulation, that's what's gonna happen. And then you're gonna eat yourself up. And you're gonna be like, I'm not good enough. And I've had friends, like I've had myself where I had friends like that and I was like, why is he friends with me? I don't have anything to offer. And it's only that at one point where I grew, where I found my skills to be good enough that I was like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't think like that. It's the same thing that that woman told me once, which is just approach it positively. If you would think yourself to be good enough, you'd be good enough, which is the same thing that I just said to you. The biggest issue is that people don't believe they're good enough, which is they always take the path of comfort then. You took the path of comfort by not telling this person how you feel. And one of my mentors always said, um, he said, in life you're gonna always have crossroads. And on this crossroad, you always have a path to comfort and a path to growth. And you always have to take a path of growth. It's always less nice, uh, it's, sometimes it's horrible, but at the end, it's the best thing you could do. And the same thing goes in those moments with that friend, potential friend, which is mode one is always the path of growth. It's always the one where there's no manipulation, and it's always the one where it saves everything and it exposes everything. It exposes the people that manipulate as well. But in that sense, it's always about you. If you don't feel good enough, everything is gonna shatter until you feel good enough. And, and this is where the commonalities between the me and you guys come in a little bit, which is um, until I realized that, everything was going shit. And the moment I realized that, my life started going up. And, and I didn't have the luxury to <coughs> feel like that. I didn't have the luxury to feel shitty about myself, to not feel good enough, because I lost a lot of friends on the, on the way. And so I realized it really quickly. 
And you guys, with all due respect, also don't have the luxury to feel like that. You have to restart an entire new life in a new country. So you need to figure out a way where you feel good enough as fast as possible. Whether you go learn a new language, a new skill that you can offer your friend or something like that, or you just accept that you are good enough by being mode one with this person. You don't have the luxury. People that grow up here, that have a nice life, a nice family and everything, and, and they don't go in the flow of life, they can do whatever they want. But you guys are kind of caught on this river and you need to figure out shit fast. So that's kind of my advice to that. Yeah. What's your take on fake it till you make it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can, so I mean, that's, I was in Las Vegas and a client of mine was speaking on stage and uh, he said, so in business you have two kinds of people. You have flash and you have uh, infrastructure. I don't know how he called it, but like the infrastructure guy. So flash would be someone that like, I used to do that as well, which is like I would meet up in a really fancy hotel and then um, get like really big clients there. And then like I would go as if I was going to the room, but I wasn't, I was like going. <laughs> so that's flash, which works. Uh, and then you have the infrastructure, which at the moment I am, which is I have like an entire team behind me and we can do stuff. So both work, um, but again, it's the same with how do you feel. Throughout my entire journey, I was arrogant, so I felt like I was gonna kick ass. But then you know what happened, so, and I don't share this story a lot, but uh, we did that project for Coca-Cola. That was pure flash. They called me up and they said, let's do a commercial, and I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> then I figured it out and we did it and it was a really good commercial. But then they invited me to their uh, head office and this was like in the beginning of our company still. And I came there and like, I didn't know what to prepare. This was like the first time, like it was a huge company. So I kind of like made like A4 papers and I'm, you know, I go online and I go this business canvas model thingy, just start drafting everything. I go into this office and this is like the head marketing manager of Coca-Cola here. And I'm like, so this is your business canvas model, this is the, and I'm like standing there and then he's like, you guys have really good stuff to offer and you've delivered good result, but don't bring this, these papers anymore. <laughs> so Flash will get you to a point until, especially with multinationals, like at one point you're gonna get, in business especially when you get to that level, um, the flash people don't make it, like you can see right away who has experience or not. Yeah. Um, when I approach companies, especially with, because we cater to coaches and trainers as well outside of multinationals, because they have a lot of videos as well. And some of them actually, um, like for instance, would speak here or would speak at a big event like TEDx that we film. And we would approach these speakers and I'd be like, hey guys, so we, because we have a really cost efficient price where we deliver like the most premium product. But because we deliver in high quantity, we can drive the price down. So any normal coach or trainer would, <coughs> would jump on it. Um, and so I approach these speakers that are super big and super cool and they're like, oh, I've worked with this company and this company. And, uh, and I approach them and I'm like, hey, so we have this. Like, is it better maybe that we work together with your marketing team and then they can figure it out? And that's like the moment where I see that they're all flash because they don't have the budget or they don't have the, so, but like the clients, for instance, the clients that we have at the moment, they do have the budget. They do have their marketing teams and we work together with them. And so you see they're very much, the way they talk is completely different to the way flash people talk. And, and so at one point you start like really seeing them. You see the flash people, you see the infrastructure people. Um, so it can carry you to a certain point, but at that certain point, like you'll need infrastructural people and then they will read you out. But I believe in it, like it's still good stuff. Um, I still, I always wear like this stuff. I always wear a good watch. Um, it only brings, there's a, so I met Neil Patel in Las Vegas and he, uh, said, he wrote a blog post where he said, I invested $100,000 in my wardrobe and I earned $600,000 more because of it. So it does work. 
Um, and like we're not in Silicon Valley. Like there, it works with the teachers and everything. But my mentor always said, so I have a, I had a mentor who was special forces, and and he said always like when you dress nice, it's not for you. It's to show the respect that you have towards other. So when you, that's how I dress. Like I don't dress. Like shitty, I don't come here with my jogging. So I'm like, hey guys, let's talk about. It. <laughs> it's like you dress not to impress, you dress out of respect for others. So, yeah, flash versus. Like, yeah, you have to fake it till you make it for sure. But at some levels, they will weed you out. <laughs> guys, we have like 10 or 15 more minutes until <laughs> pizza arrives. We we have some pizzas coming over for lunch. Uh, so use the time, and then you can uh, also hijack Lava at lunch. But uh, yeah, I, have a, I have a meeting actually at one, so well, Lava will miss the pizza. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yes. Or Lava. Uh, how do you overcome a feeling? How do you overcome uh, a feeling that uh, which is that you suck at everything? What kind of feeling you have to my life? So. I used to feel like that all the time, <laughs> truly. Um, validate. The reason I went into that sales job is just for myself to have the numbers to know that I'm good enough. Um, and, and so one of my new clients that uh, has come on my, on my coaching program, which I stopped getting new clients on, but um, his main problem is, for instance, that. And so, what I'm trying to give him is a validation of his skills. Because once you have that validation of, I am good enough, I have something to give, um, that's when you can do all the enough, like the innovations and cool stuff. Because as you're doing the cool stuff, you're always gonna have those thoughts like, I'm not good enough, I'm I, like, What's gonna happen like next month if I don't have enough money? So for me personally, what happens in those moments is, oh, I broke that record, oh, it's totally fine, I'm gonna work. And so if I don't get a client for a week, I start thinking like that. And then I think, okay, worst case, like I'll go and I do that. So I validated my skills, and now it carries me through the, the hard moments. So the same goes with you, you need to validate your skills. What skill is it, is the question. If it's coding, for instance, let's assume you get a job at Facebook or Google, I don't think you can get a bigger validation than that. And what's gonna happen then is, you'll have to accept that you're good enough. <laughs> the problem is accepting that you're good enough. And once you get that big job, then you're like, oh, okay, cool, what's next? <laughs> and then you can always go into another industry and you'll be like, worst case, I'll do that. Um, and if you don't get that job, you'll get a job somewhere else. And then you'll have to accept again that you're good enough because you've gotten a job. People actually pay you money to do this. So now you're good enough. Um, when I made my first sale, I made my first sale in Lightning Video Editors. It was like a 400 euro sale, which is nothing. But at that moment, I, uh, I told everyone I was a professional videographer, like professional filmmaker. And uh, it was 400 euros. It's, it's not real. But you have to accept that you're good enough. And that little arrogancy that I had is the thing that kind of carried me through. Um, you always have to stay humble enough to listen to the people around you. But you need to be arrogant enough to say that you're good enough. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you, you should be arrogant enough to make them believe that you're better than the others. Yeah. You have to trust that when you say, and this is, this is the thing that made it for me. So there's a movie called Pursuit of Happiness by mm -hmm. Will Smith. Yeah. So I, when I was like in that shitty situation, like I was watching that movie every day almost. Like not every day, but I was watching it a lot. Because there's this one scene uh, where Will Smith walks into the boardroom uh, with all these big guys. And he's like covered in paint and like, it's like his interview. And the guy asks him like, uh, what would you do if like a guy with paint walks in into like this investment firm? Like, would you hire, like, what would you ask me if I hired you? 
And then uh, Will Smith answers, he must have had some good pants on. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then, and then, but he says, um, no matter what, and that, that's the thing that, that's how I operate my business. No matter what you present to me, if I don't know the, like, I will know the answer. And if I don't know the answer, I will the do answer, the best to find the answer. I will do yeah, my I best, know. like, I will do everything in my power yes. to find the answer. And that was the reaction that I had to Coca Cola when they called me. So they called me, and I was like, okay, so I will do whatever it takes to find the answer. And usually, it's enough. And so you have to trust that you have that skill set. You have to trust that you will do everything in your power and your everything in your power is good enough. Um, it's only a problem when your everything that you do is not good enough. But I can assure you that if people really want something, they'll do it. Elon Musk is going to Mars, so. You know, it's like, and start small, it start small. So, just watch that scene and we'll be good enough. I think we're running a bit of time, so let's not keep Loba over time. Loba, maybe if you wanna share something, they're two weeks away, three weeks away from graduation. They're gonna pursue a different paths, some of them web developers, some of them completely different things. Uh, what do you wanna leave with them at the end? Stay in touch. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, just, don't give up and trust your, I think the biggest issue in the room that I've covered from all of you is trust yourself. Um, and if you're struggling with trusting yourself, like talk to people around you, validate your skills. Um, and, and stay in touch with Theodore, for instance, stay in touch with the people that were here that know that your skills are good enough. Because like, it'll always pop up. Like you will always feel not good enough in some way or something will pop up, the problem's too big for you. And that's when you call up somebody here, call up Theodore, you call up someone somewhere and they will assure you that you're good enough. And to the question of mentorship, those are also mentors. The people that will make you that you're good enough, that's it. Sometimes it doesn't come internally, sometimes it comes from others. So I hope that uh, <laughs> give it up to Lova. Thank you so much. We have snacks here at Restart and the famous Restart t-shirt. Let's take a yeah, let's take a picture with that. No, actually let's take a picture with everyone. Let's take it from yes. that angle so Lova and I can sit here in front and we can make a maybe we can hit up. Good. There we go. I also want to join it. I have a restart t-shirt. Oh, yeah. You have one wearing the model of the boot camp. There we go. Uh, if you don't see the camera, the camera doesn't see you. Awesome, thank you so much, Loa. I had a great time, I'm not sure about you guys. Thank you. 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 you. Give me the names of three most influenced books you read. Ever read. Three. Well, the book that's coming out right now, right? No, <laughs> that's the book. No, 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 I'm joking. Uh, the same to you. The thing the is, like, you. Mode 1 is one of the most, the best books ever, but it's very graphical, and so my girlfriend read it, and so she can read through the graphical content and not be, like, scared about it. Mm -hmm. But I truly believe that. If you would read Mode 1, Alan Roger Curry, and you would approach life the way he approaches life, even though he approaches it graphical, um, and you use that in business, in health, and relationships, uh, that is the number one thing that pretty much saved everything. Like, when I was approaching people in relationships and everything, at one point I gave up. I accepted that I would never have good friends around me or a relationship. And then I discovered that book. Where he talks about yeah, mode one yeah, by Alan yeah, yeah, yeah. and he said you don't have to be like, hey, talk about Starbucks for half an hour and then be, you won't be my friend. No, he said like you just go like from the straight and just be like, hey, this is what I do, this is what I want, and let's do something together. Um, and that gives more results and it wastes less of your time. And most of the business people are like that, and that's why I like this. This is one, two. Um, like influence, influence is a really good book.
if you do if you do business. We made an agreement with the Ted. I'll scan it all. Like I have an output on the thirty day challenge you get like this output of all the books. Mm. So there isn't three. There's like if you sign up, there's an output of all the books that I always recommend no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, so go there and why not free dot com. Sign up, you'll get an output, go to the output and it's literally like all the books that I recommend. And I don't recommend that many books, mm -hmm. but the ones that I recommend are there. Because there isn't three books. There is, you have obstacles, you look for mentors. Mentors can be in books, in YouTube videos, and everything. So I'm, for instance, in a relationship for like a year and a half now. So which books am I reading at the moment? Like there are books like Seven Ways to, to Make a Marriage Work, which is one of those super good books. <laughs> it's an amazing book, right? Where women are from Mars and... Yeah, I read Yeah, that book by Dr. John Gray. So that's like... Those are the books I'm focusing on right now. I can assume that's not the books you want to hear. No, he wants to be a doctor. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you see, so those are the books that, it's like you have a problem, go read that book. Uh, and the output is there. And so if you have a problem in sales, this is the book you're going to be reading. If you have a problem in building a business, Tim Ferriss, for instance, the four hour work week can kickstart you and give you an idea of what is possible. Um, but yeah, it's like it's always like whichever problem you have. Um, yeah. But mode one is one of those things yeah. that it changes your life because the way you approach life, you don't leave space for manipulation anymore. So that's like the one thing that it shapes the basics of every the foundation to which you approach life, and that's like your main key. If if there's only one book that you would read and it would do everything like make you successful and everything. It's to approach that mode one mentality. There's no manipulation. You won't have any shitty relationships anymore. You'd be able to approach people, break up with them when necessary, walk away with them from them when necessary, walk away from bad clients when necessary. So mode one is like one of those things. But again, it's really radical. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. Awesome. Cool. And you can blow up almost every week at the Venture Cup Day, right? Yeah. Right. So definitely say hi. Uh, yeah goes along with uh, his advice. Good. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, if you guys if they want, want to stay in touch with you, they send you an email or how Yeah, why not 3.com, so why not, and then the number 3.com. Mm -hmm. When you sign up, you get access to like, a ton of good stuff, like ebook, uh, you get the 30 day challenge. So you literally follow me last month, October, every day. Um, I film something and I share uh, a specific tool that I would share with like my coaching clients and everything. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's the tip of the iceberg, but it will be way enough if you're starting out and wanting to skyrocket like your life in this new country. And the good thing is I moved the 1st of September and I started shooting it the 1st of October. Mm -hmm. So you actually see what I'm doing. And during that month, I closed like two of the biggest multinationals in this country. So. Obviously, I closed them in November, so you don't know that during the thing. Actually, yes, one of them, TEDx Rotterdam, for instance, mm -hmm. I'm literally sharing on day 14 or something like that. Hey, we have a partnership now. Mm -hmm. So you can literally follow me there and see how I do and what I do. And I share also how to create goals, how to create visions, how to make everything super practical, which trackers I use, which uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And it's my personal email, so you can hit reply and have the same picture. Cool.